Welcome everybody to another Celebration of Mind presentation from G4G. We do this on the 21st of every month in honor of Martin Gardner, who was born on the 21st. My name is Skana Britton and today's speaker is Steve Treadle. But before I introduce him, I have two announcements for you. The first is that next month, exactly four weeks from now, Kate Jones will be presenting and the title of her presentation is Periodic Table of Polyform Puzzles. And the other thing I want to tell you about is that we have a brand new G4G calendar, which looks like this. There it is. Um, it is full of pictures, full of bios of people, and most importantly, full of puzzles. It's a really cool calendar. So um, Steve is a geometric topologist. And he got his PhD in 2019 at UC Santa Barbara. Now, I happen to live in Santa Barbara, coincidentally, just a few miles from the university. And the scene that you see behind me, which is my normal Zoom background, is the beach right at the university. And Steve saw this scene twice a day, pretty much every day of graduate school. So it's even more impressive that he managed to get his PhD done with all that temptation. Um, after he graduated, he got a postdoc at ICERM, which stands for Institute for Computational and Experimental Research in Mathematics at Brown University. And there he met his collaborators on the project that he's going to tell you about today. That's where they started working on it. And they're here, they're all here today too. Um, the title of, oh, sorry. Um, after the postdoc or kind of in the middle, he went to Stanford. He had an appointment at Stanford as the Seydoux assistant professor in mathematics. And he actually had to start teaching in March. So he came in January to California. And before he started teaching, the pandemic started. So he's actually never taught at Stanford. Um, but he's an assistant professor there teaching classes online. So the title of today's talk is Visiting the Thurston Geometries Computer Graphics in Curved Space. And as you will see, the, their project is both for research purposes and expository purposes. And we're about to see a great exposition. Okay. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining me this Sunday morning. I'm really excited to share with you a project that I've been working on for a little over a year now with uh, my collaborators, Remy Kula, Sabeta Matsumoto, and Henry Siegerman. Um, I see they're all here. I'm not sure if we can spotlight people in the video or not, if we figured that out. But if not, um, yeah, everything I'm going to talk about today is joint work with all three of them. So, I'm a, I'm a low dimensional topologist, so I'm interested in low dimensional topology and geometry that goes with that. And maybe a, a first, um, <laughs> first disclaimer here about how we use that word versus how that word might get used outside of mathematics. I, I remember, you know, my dad's in the audience and I was explaining this to him when I was in grad school, trying to pick a topic that in math, low dimensional means dimensions two, three, and four, whereas high dimensional means above that. So I'm interested in shapes, geometry, and stuff that happens in those dimensions. And today I want to talk particularly about a way of illustrating dimension three. But to give maybe a, a wider overview of how we visualize these things, like in research, how, how mathematicians think about these different dimensions, each kind of has its own flavor. Um, I wanted to share a couple pictures from research papers in two, three, and four dimensions to give a sense of how we work with these in mathematics. So in, in two-dimensional topology, we have the luxury being three-dimensional beams of being able to see things extrinsically if we choose to. We can take a, a two-dimensional surface, at least an orientable one, and we can embed it in three-dimensional space. We can see it in front of us, turn it around, and think that way, think extrinsically. We even do so when the properties we care about are intrinsic to the surface. For instance, when you learn about Gaussian curvature, you learn about it often by thinking about the principal curvatures in three-dimensional space. 
or when you study the mapping class group, which is where these figures are from, um, a paper um, by Justin Lanier giving um, a generating set for the mapping class group out of torsion elements. Even though you're looking at an abstract property of the surface, it's helpful to visualize the symmetries by embedding the problem into 3D and looking extrinsically at the world. Now, four-dimensional topology, we obviously don't have that luxury. We can't take a four-dimensional shape that we're interested in and put it in front of us and look at it because, well, there's just not enough room. And so, luckily, it's not far away from visualizable. And so, what we can do is look at things schematically. And so, in a lot of four-dimensional topology, there's lots of tricks for taking the information about this four-dimensional space you care about and encoding it in terms of lower dimensional diagrams that schematically represent like a blueprint for building the space. So this particular example here is from a process called Kirby calculus. It's a way of talking about four dimensional shapes while drawing two dimensional pictures of one dimensional objects in three dimensional space. So using a lot of lower dimensional pieces to rigorously understand what's going on in four dimensions. And three-dimensional topology, living in between these two, actually kind of benefits from both approaches in lots of mathematical work. So here's some figures from papers that I really like. The one on the left here is um, from a paper of Thurston, um, showing an extrinsic view of three-dimensional topology. Now, you can't see everything extrinsically because, for instance, we, we live in 3D. Like You can't see entire three-dimensional worlds always from the outside. But you can, you can imagine in your mind's eye a bit what it looks like to see three-dimensional worlds from the outside. So th these are pictures like that. Um, but we can also reason about three-dimensional worlds schematically. We can do like four dimensions and you can encode the structure of a three-dimensional world in lower dimensional, two-dimensional pictures. So this here is called a Hegard diagram. And it's a way that you can encode stuff. And so one cool thing in three-dimensional topology is we can often switch back and forth between these pictures in your mind for the same problem. You can try and think about something a little bit from the outside, think about surfaces inside of a three-dimensional shape, and then you can switch over and think schematically. But while these approaches are really natural for doing mathematics, for anyone who is not a mathematician thinking about this, you're saying, hey, Steve, you're like missing the obvious one here. Like we're talking about how do we visualize three-dimensional space, like we live in three-dimensional space. What do you mean? Like that's, that's the clear one. We definitely know how to visualize three-dimensional space. My entire life happens in if basically three-dimensional Euclidean flat space. I know what it looks like inside of three space. And so that's an alternative that we get in three dimensions because we are three-dimensional. We get to ask a new question that we can't really ask for, um, for other dimensional shapes, what is it like to live inside of a three manifold? Um, what would it be like to live inside of a space like that's three dimensional everywhere, locally looks just like where we live, but maybe is curved globally or is twisted or multi-connected in weird ways? Maybe there's wormholes, maybe there's positive or negative curvatures of space. What would it be like if space was really like that instead of the Euclidean space that we find ourselves in? Now, the first time that I personally started thinking about this problem was in, in graduate school, I was reading Thurston's book, uh, Three-Dimensional Geometry and Topology. And I was trying to do the exercises to see if this is a direction I wanted to go in life. Um, and some of the exercises were similar to an exercise in the standard math book. Like they would lead to me doing some computation and it was clear from the problem what computation I was supposed to do. And then I got to this problem, problem 2.79, not even too far into the book. And the problem asked me to describe the sensation of a person in the three sphere, which is the, a curved three-dimensional space, usually thought of as the unit sphere in four dimensions. Describe the sensation that a person living on that space would feel when being acted on by a one parameter subgroup. That is, while the space is rotated in R4, what would you feel? And I wasn't sure how to interpret the question at first, much less what kind of an answer you would expect. What, what, do, you, what do you mean? What do you feel? <laughs> but I was really intrigued and I started thinking about it and um, started like a long rabbit hole that led to now. 
Um, <laughs> and so today I want to tell you part of my answer to this question. I'm not going to talk about what it would feel like in different spaces. I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions about that in like the question session afterwards, but we're going to focus on just what would it look like if you were in a space and the space was curved, maybe multiply connected, what would your visual experience be like? And so the first thing we need to do to answer that is to think about vision. Um, how does vision work? And in day-to-day -day life, we, we have a, a simple model of vision that works almost all the time. Light enters your eyes from the world and it enters your eyes traveling along a straight line. The reason I see something above me is because the straight line connecting that object to my eye leaves my eye in the upwards direction. Why I see something below me is because the straight line leaving my eye connecting me to the object leaves in the downwards direction. Um, but more generally, if space was curved, the natural generalization of straight line is a geodesic. And so if you tried to write down, say, classical physics in a curved space, the natural analog is light travels along geodesics, which are locally the shortest path, just like straight lines are the shortest path in flat space. So here's a schematic of that. Um, trying to draw it in two dimensions for you. Think about me as being this little orange sticker person um, slapped on the surface of this two-dimensional torus. And I want to look at the green diamond over there. What direction do I look at to see the diamond? Well, since there's no, there's no straight lines in the Euclidean sense on this surface, but I look in the direction of the geodesic, that is the straightest line on the surface, the locally shortest path. And so one way I would see it is by looking straight along these lines here. Looking in that direction, light would curve along the surface of the torus and reach the green diamond. So I would see it over there. So that gives us a way of trying to computationally understand how would you draw life in a curved space? Well, you could set up your camera somewhere in a model of your space, and you could shoot out rays, shoot out geodesics, and see what they hit. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. I want to start with a two-dimensional model to try and show how curvature affects geodesics, how curving space would change what you would see, and then we'll ramp it up to 3D, and then we'll look at some interesting examples. So first, here's a flat two-dimensional world. Um, so you can think about this point down here as being you, like, or being your camera or whatever, and these rays coming out or going into it are rays of light from the world um, shining on that camera lens. So when space is flat, all of those are straight lines, and so our vision really accurately represents the world we see around us. The reason you see something to your right when it's actually to your right is because the straight line leaving your eye on the right side hits that object. Same for the left rays. They leave off into the left of the world, so you see things over there. Now, that point seems really pedantic to keep making here, but the reason I'm pointing it out is because if we let space curve, so I'm going to add some curvature here. Actually, what I'm going to do is just add like a, a two-dimensional Gaussian in the middle, just as a, as a representative example for us to get started. Um, if you curve space, it actually changes the trajectory of the locally shortest paths. The geodesics on that space bend in relation to that curvature. So if these were the rays of light entering your camera in a world with this curved bump in it, let's try and imagine what we would actually see. So looking off to the side here, space is asymptotically flat. All of the light rays still look like straight lines, so vision looks relatively normal and is unaffected. Same on the other side. Over here, vision's totally normal. But in the middle, what's going on here? Well, in trying to be the locally shortest path, light rays are curving around the mountain. Just like if you walked up to a mountain, you might find a shorter path kind of walking around the side rather than going directly over the top. But this behavior causes the light rays to actually focus. Um, light rays from the left curve right, light rays from the right curve left. And 
you end up with an interesting mirage. What, so what would you see here? If you were looking at someone behind this curved bump in space, they would be upside down or they would be reversed. Um, light leaving the right side of your eye now hits the left side of the world. And light leaving the left side of your eye now hits the right side of the world. So I want you to imagine this in 3D for a second. We, we'll, we'll go there briefly. But what would happen if I took normal flat three-dimensional space and I took a small region of space and I decided to introduce curvature to bend the metric of space in this little ball in front of me, what would the world look like? What sort of optical mirage would adding that curvature cause? And since we can simulate this in 2D here, I can run the same simulation on my computer in 3D. Um, I can, for every pixel on the screen, instead of for every direction coming out of this little sphere, I can shoot out a geodesic into the world and I can see where it hits. And so here's a, here's a live simulation running of that, um, where in front of me, just like in the two-dimensional case, I can control the size of that disturbance or the, the curvature, the steepness of that bump. But as you can see, as soon as the, the metric gets distorted in a little bubble in front of you, the world looks fine away from that. And near the curvature, the focusing of light due to positive curvature inside of that bubble gives a mirage, makes the world upside down. You have to look up to see the ground and down to see the sky if you look through the changing curvature. So this isn't a particularly mathematically interesting example. Um, this is just a like an easy example for us to get started, a space which is basically flat Euclidean everywhere. And we've done the simplest thing. We've added a little tiny, tiny bump in curvature. And we've seen what that does to the world. A bump in curvature corresponds to a mirage in your vision, um, some sort of like geometric lensing of light. And you could make many examples like this. For instance, if you imagine taking a flat two-dimensional space and instead of adding a bump, maybe wrinkling it like a rug, um, putting in lots of folds and bumps, um, you could do the same to three-dimensional space. You could change the curvature in lots of random ways. And you could make worlds like this that look like kind of like you live in a hall of mirrors, like everything's curved and distorted in all sorts of different directions. And since there's so many worlds, so many different ways to do this, um, a question we should focus on mathematically would be which out of all of these three-dimensional worlds, if I want to understand what it's like inside of special mathematical three-dimensional universes, which world should I be looking at? Um, what mirages, what types of metrics are the important ones? And so here's an example in two dimensions where all of these surfaces are topologically spheres. Um, oh, okay, good question in the chat. In this demo, we're not ray tracing into a 3D model. No, um, so that's actually what's going on in the demo here, good point is there's just empty space and there is a sphere out at infinity, um, just a large sphere in my model. And so I'm ray tracing from my camera out into the world. And once I get a certain distance away where I know the metric has become asymptotically flat, I just sample the direction I'm pointing on a spherical image and return the picture. So when when the bump is gone, we're just in, in flat space. We're looking at a spherical photograph. I can spin around here. And when you put the bump in, we're still looking at that spherical photograph, but now we're ray tracing. Can I say a little bit about the dark ring along the sphere? Sure. So that dark ring is actually just the image of the point which is directly behind it. So let me see if I can, um, I probably can't fly around to get it somewhere else interesting right now, but the reason it's kind of dark around there is just the dark tree that's behind it. If I put it up in the sky, then there's a light ring around it. Okay, so yeah, if we're gonna try and select out some geometries to visit, that was one, but I picked that one not for mathematical reasons, but for expositional reasons. Like it has, its curvature is very simple everywhere except in one little region. But if we're looking for mathematically simple, if you look at all of these different two spheres here, all of the, these surfaces are all homeomorphic to the sphere. 
um, there's one metric on the sphere, which is in some sense better, um, the constant curvature metric. So the third picture here, that's the most symmetric possible metric on the sphere. And so if I was looking mathematically at this, that would be the sphere I'm most interested in, the most symmetrical sphere. In two dimensions, there's a wonderful theorem called the uniformization theorem, which tells you that every two-dimensional shape has a special metric like this. Um, it either comes from the sphere or from the Euclidean plane or from the hyperbolic plane. And so if you want to understand two-dimensional geometry, you can really focus as a first pass on these three spaces. And if you understand these three spaces, you can understand a geometry, the most symmetric geometry that goes on every two-dimensional world. Now, there's an analog of this in 3D. Uh, it's called the geometrization theorem. It was conjectured by Thurston and proved by Perlman. And it's a little more complicated. It doesn't say that every three-dimensional world has a most symmetric metric like we had in 2D. Not everything has its own special geometry. But instead, three-dimensional manifolds are like Legos. Um, every three-dimensional manifold is built out of Lego pieces. Um, and those pieces come in exactly eight different flavors. Um, so you can build everything out of geometric pieces, and all of the pieces have a nice geometry of only eight different types. Um, these are usually called the Thurston geometries, after Thurston, um, since he conjectured this. And so if we're trying to look at three-dimensional geometry, three-dimensional topology, the first thing to understand is the building blocks. And so the natural starting place is, can we see these eight spaces? And so for the second half of the talk here, that's what I want to want to do is talk about those spaces. And I'll tell you a little bit about how, how we actually ray trace or ray march in them. And then a little bit about one or two of the spaces, a cool fact that I like. But first, we'll just start with a couple of visualizations. So what are the eight spaces? So the first is Euclidean space. That is the space we're used to. Um, flat three-dimensional geometry. Here we see a, a lattice of spheres in Euclidean space and a lattice of other spheres, like little light bulbs rotating around them. Um, just to give you a sense of depth, this is something that you could make in normal computer graphics. Like we're just, you could just draw this in flat space. It's just a bunch of spheres. Um, then there's a three-dimensional analog of hyperbolic space, which you may be familiar with. Um, this is a particularly interesting one for three-dimensional topologists. A lot of the interesting questions really come down to understanding this space. So this particular visualization here, we're flying around inside of a hyperbolic manifold called Seifert-Weber-Dodecahedral space. And just like hyperbolic space, that's constant negative curvature, constant positive curvature is also one of the Thurston geometries. That's the geometry of the three-dimensional sphere. So here is a object. It's kind of like a stylized one skeleton of the hypercube um, moving around inside of the three-dimensional sphere. It's not changing shape or size. It's just rotating. But the way it looks, if you lived inside of that space, because of the curvature, it looks like it's distorting, um, like we saw in that first animation with the bump. Uh, curvature is causing that sort of mirage behavior. After the three constant curvature geometries, there's two geometries you can build out of their lower dimensional cousins. So the geometry of the hyperbolic plane cross a line has hyperbolic geometry in, in one direction, and it's a bunch of hyperbolic planes stacked on top of each other, like a cylinder made out of hyperbolic planes. And similarly, you can make the geometry of a sphere times a line. This is like the analog of one analog of a cylinder in four-dimensional space. So just like a cylinder is a bunch of circles stacked on top of each other, S2 cross E geometry is a bunch of spheres stacked on top of each other. Ooh, issue cross E like a can of Pringles. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Exactly, you're stacking a bunch of things. That's excellent. Um, <laughs> it's like a can of Pringles. You're stacking a bunch of negatively curved spaces directly parallelly on top of each other. Absolutely right. <laughs> So let's see. And then after this, there are three more. So remember, there's eight, there's eight types of Legos for three-dimensional manifolds. 
there were these three constant curvature ones, these two that we could build out of products of lower dimensional ones. I guess we could really build Euclidean plane cross a line, but that's just Euclidean three space. And then there's three more, um, three stranger ones. They're built out of three dimensional Lie groups. So this one is called nil geometry. Um, it's built out of the Heisenberg group, like upper triangular matrices with ones down the diagonal. It's a it's the geometry that goes with that. <laughs> um, oh, onion flavored Pringles, man, is that maybe that's four dimensional H two cross S two? <laughs> um, then there's uh, SL two geometry, which doesn't have a very creative name. It's the geometry of the Lie group SL2. At least it's a very direct name. Um, SL2R being two by two matrices with determinant one. This is um, this is a view inside of there. This is actually looking at the unit tangent bundle to the genus two surface, um, some sort of tiling of that space as you're moving around. And finally, a geometry called Sol or Solve geometry, which is built on another three dimensional Lie group. This is a, a lattice of cubes inside of Sol geometry. So these are the eight building blocks of um, three-dimensional manifolds. And this is what our, our project has been aimed at, is trying to, trying to make a good visualizations, intrinsic visualizations of these, and in a way that you all can play with them, use them for research, use them for fun. And so we've put together a website. Right now, it's really in the preliminary version. Um, it's basically just a spot where I stash examples that are currently working. Um, but if anyone wants to play around with it, it's three-dimensional dot space. Again, this is all with Remy Coulon, Sabeta Matsumoto, and Henry Siegerman. Um, I think we have the link available to paste in the chat. Otherwise, it's a memorable link, three-dimensional dot space. So you can check out more examples there. But I want to talk just briefly about implementing this on a computer. So how do we actually make these simulations? And if you want, I'm not going to talk about many details here, but if you want more details, um, there's actually, we have a paper on the archive, which can also will probably be pasted in the chat here, but it's called Ray Marching Thurston Geometries. Um, you can look it up. It has, it has tons of pictures and it has all the details of how you would go about um, constructing this. So first, just thinking about three general 3D graphics, how do you draw a three-dimensional scene on a screen? Well, one, one common method is if your objects in the world are described by some sort of a mesh or built out of, built out of pieces in 3D, you could project those 3D things onto a screen. You could have a function from 3D onto the screen, which projects world space onto the screen. The simplest one would be like orthographic projection in, in R3. Like for normal 3D graphics, you could just delete one of the coordinates that projects you onto a screen. Or you could do perspective projection, um, where you project along the lines. Now, that's easy to do if you know where every point in space is going to land on your screen. You need to know that to do something like this. And in curved space, that's not something we know very well. Like, where is a point going to end up on the screen? Well, it's going to end up wherever a geodesic connects your eye to that point. And finding that geodesic is a hard math problem. So instead of trying to write down this function on all of our three, instead, we can just try and solve that math problem, try and find the geodesics going out into the world from the screen. Um, and this is ray tracing or ray marching. So this is what I did in the previous simulation you saw and in all of those videos. We are starting with every pixel on the screen. We're assigning to that pixel a tangent vector. The tangent vector is the direction you see that pixel out of your eye. And then we are ray tracing out into the world. We're shooting a ray out, and we're seeing what it hits. And when we figure out what it hits, we figure out what to color that pixel. And we just do that for every single pixel. So ray tracing does this by knowing your object in the scene and knowing equations for like, or get a good description of the geodesic, it finds intersection points. Um, but the, uh, the other method, a method that we're using is called ray marching to do the same idea. And it's just, it's a little easier for us because it's very mathematical. So instead of describing an object as a mesh, like you would here, 
we describe an object by a distance function, which is a natural quantity in Riemannian geometry. So the object, like a sphere here, is described by the function, which measures the distance to a sphere. That's how it's, that's how the computer knows about the object. So maybe my scene here is a sphere and a plane down below, and I'm looking down at the plane. So I want to eventually find the intersection point of this geodesic with the plane. The way ray marching does that is at every point, it queries in space, where's the closest point in my scene? That is, how far can I travel along any geodesic without hitting anything? That's this red sphere. And so then you can follow the geodesic till there, and you can call the distance function again, and you can keep going until you reach the point. So it's, a, it's an algorithm that's really built out of geometric pieces, out of stuff that we can directly import from mathematics, which makes it very convenient for us. So like I said, I'm not going to give many of the details of implementation here, but that's kind of step one. How do we do it? We march along geodesic, so we need to solve the geodesic flow. Step two, if you want to look at a manifold that is kind of um, like a compact manifold, a manifold that's built out of this geometry, you kind of need to solve the inverse problem of like the video game Asteroid. So you may have heard like the some of these early video games are actually played on a torus because when you leave one side of the screen, you teleport to the other. If you leave the top, you teleport in from the bottom. And so you could imagine taking your flat computer screen and rolling it up into a donut, making a seamless shape on which you could play this game. We want to do the opposite. You maybe start with some shape you care about, and we want to find a way to break it, that is find a fundamental domain and a set of teleportation rules that let us compute what's actually happening on the curved shape. And then we need to actually be able to describe to the computer the scenes we're drawing. So like I said, the advantage for us is we can describe it using mathematical functions, but we need functions that are simple enough to compute so that like my poor computer won't crash when I try and demo this for you. So one way of doing that, a really simple object is a sphere. The distance function to a sphere is just the distance function from a point. Like if you measure the surface of a sphere in any geometry, like the geodesic sphere is just the points of distance r in that geometry's metric. So you can build complicated scenes from simple objects. Like here, if I take a solid space like this cube, I could delete a sphere. Since a sphere has a simple function, the deletion of a sphere also has a simple function. And I could delete some more spheres from the corners if I was feeling fancy, get some sort of a tile like this, and then build a tiling of space, build a tiling of a compact manifold from the mathematics of those simple pieces. So this is a view inside of a flat three-dimensional torus. Um, you see, and here's a view built out of the same sort of a tile. So a cube with a big sphere in the middle deleted and some, some vertices deleted out of the corners that happens in hyperbolic space instead. So, okay, so those are some of the pieces we need. We need to be able to compute geodesics. What direction do you even see things in? We need to be able to deal with tilings, deal with um, fundamental domains and shapes. And the other thing we need to deal with is lighting. Like, how are we lighting the shape? We want to do it accurately. Um, we're really trying to give an, a full, as, as full accuracy as we can view of what it would really be like if you were there. And luckily, most of the computations that go into lighting in computer graphics um, are local. They're things that happen at a particular point. So if you want to compute reflections, you can use the Riemannian metric at that point. If you want to compute light in, like lighting, you can use a lot of stuff from the Riemannian metric at that point. And so, for instance, the Fong model from normal computer graphics, most of it carries over directly, just replacing Euclidean geometry with curved geometry. Of course. Some parts of that are really difficult to carry over. Um, one part that I'll point out here is light intensity. So in Euclidean space, we know light intensity falls off as inverse square. And the reason for that is if you think about a flash of light leaving a sphere, or a flash of light leaving a point, it leaves in a sphere. That sphere's area grows quadratically. And so the light intensity drops off quadratically with distance. But in curved spaces, um, 
things aren't always so simple. So here's the same animation in nil. Here's a simulation in nil geometry of a light flash leaving a point. This is an extrinsic view. We're just drawing it in a model so you can see what's happening. Here, um, geodesics are not unique. Geodesics spiral. We'll take, a, we'll take a closer look at nil in just a second here. Um, and so the, the sphere of light rays leaving a point actually self-intersects in a really complicated pattern of rings, leading to really complicated calculations of intensity compared to the Euclidean case. So that's just like uh, a flavor of some of the things you have to deal with. But in the last 10 minutes here or so, I want to, I want to show you a couple cool things you can learn from this simulation. So I'm going to focus on nil geometry. Personally, it's my favorite. Um, but I will start by showing something cool from hyperbolic geometry. So one thing from hyperbolic space that could be familiar, even if you're not a researcher in this area, but you like mathematical illustration, um, is limit sets of Kleinian groups. So a Kleinian group is a discrete group acting on hyperbolic three space. Um, they lead to hyperbolic three manifolds. You take their quotients or orbifolds. And one cool property of these spaces is kind of a set of points out on the boundary of hyperbolic space um, called the limit set that goes with it. So if you haven't seen this, there's a great book called Indra's Pearls that actually talks about computationally how you could find these things and draw pictures, such as this picture um, going on on the boundary of hyperbolic space. So one cool thing about internal, like drawing the inside view of these manifolds is we can draw a picture of the limit set like this without trying to literally compute the limit set. Instead, I can just go inside of the compact, inside of the manifold. Um, so the one I'm going to show you here is an infinite volume hyperbolic manifold. But we can go inside of there, and you can just draw a sphere. And the limit set can be defined as like the limit of the, the limit of this orbit under the group mathematically. And so what that leads to pictorially is the limit set is the pattern you see out at infinity from this collection of spheres. So kind of the, the fractal pattern you see out at infinity here is the limit set of this group. Whereas we weren't like, we didn't set out to draw the limit set. We just drew a sphere in the manifold and naturally you can see it come out. Okay, there we go. So cool. So the, the last example I want to talk about is nil geometry. Like I was saying, this, this is personally, like, I think my favorite one um, because it's surprising, but still understandable. So nil geometry has a mixture of positive and negative curvature in different directions, which causes really big distortions in your view. Um, So before looking at some more inside pictures like that, I want to show a simulation just to give a feel of what the geodesics in nil look like. So imagine this white sphere is like a camera. This is, or this is your head and you're looking out forwards here. These lines, these spirals, like helices emanating from your head, that's the lines that light would follow if you were in nil geometry. Those are the geodesics for nil. Uh, to compare to the Euclidean case, Here's what you would see in Euclidean geometry. So if I'm looking at this, I see the bridge above me because the straight lines that leave my eye going up stay going up. I see the lake to the right and left because the lines leaving to the right and left stay right and left. Whereas in nil geometry, they're all kind of focused ahead. Even the peripheral of my vision is the light rays are bent straight downwards down the bridge. And if I were to turn my head, let's take a look over here. Let's say I wanted to look at the lake in nil geometry. I wanted to look in that direction. The light rays leave my eye pointed towards the lake, but very quickly the curvature of space causes them to bend and they, they bifurcate. Almost all of them end up looking down the bridge. Oh, let me line that up. There we go. So this leads to a kind of confusing picture. Even if I point myself towards the direction I think the lake would be in, my vision disagrees, and I mostly still see the bridge. 
So I'm not going to draw this scene with this actual bridge as a background, um, <laughs> but let's draw a, a lattice of spheres in nil geometry, um, where we can kind of get a feel for this. The, these spheres are kind of evenly scattered throughout space. What I want you to notice is in the middle here, we see tons and tons of tiny spheres all compressed. That's like the lake direction in the picture we were just looking at. You want to look that way, but not much of your vision goes that way. Actually, most of your vision gets sucked off in two directions. One of those is this weird area that we're seeing kind of leave the frame. Another one's going to pop in. Oh, the top side of the screen here now is coming the other side. That would be the analog of looking down the bridge. So those two pieces we're seeing, even though we're kind of seeing them both in front of us at some points, are actually diametrically opposed. They're, they're two opposite directions in nil geometry, but our light is leaving our eyes and kind of shooting off in both directions. But that's not the weirdest part about this scene, right? The weirdest part about this scene is that when you look down that direction, the balls don't look like balls anymore. Like, it's not just that there's some, where I'm mostly seen in these two weird directions. It's that when I look that way, the balls turn into weird rings. Like every time we pass through here, let's wait for another one to come back. You see that a line of balls gets distorted in your vision and turns it, like bursts into a collection of concentric rings before turning back into balls. So in this simulation, I want to um, I want to simplify things. I'm just going to draw one sphere and we'll focus on just this one sphere and try and see if we can understand where those rings are coming from. So I've, I've textured the sphere like the earth because that helps us see what point of the sphere we're actually looking at in space. And so now I'm just going to back up from the sphere. I'm standing in nil geometry in front of the sphere here. I'm kind of moving around. Um, and I'm going to back up just at uniform speed. I'm just going to keep backing up constant speed the whole time. At first, the world starts looking smaller. That makes sense. That's how things work in Euclidean space. Light rays diverge, which makes objects look smaller when they move away. I'm still backing up at constant speed, even though the Earth is starting to look a little larger now. Um, so let's just watch what happens. We'll talk about it in a second. Okay, things are getting weird. Maybe I'll stop. I'll stop backing up. So we're, we're standing right now actually quite far from the Earth, even though it's large in our vision. And the curvature of space has caused this sort of mirage to start happening. And if I keep going, the image of the Earth splits into two images. This is where the, the rings that we were seeing in the last video come from, is if you put a sphere far enough away from you in nil geometry, you end up seeing that sphere as a sphere in the middle surrounded by a ring. And if you have a line of spheres, that line of spheres will then burst into a line of rings, um, all just due to a mirage. So this is, this is a live simulation here. You can play with this one on our um, website if you'd like to check it out for yourself. You can fly around, put the sphere at different distances from you, and see what it looks like. So finally, I want to I give an explanation for that. How can we explain that using geometry? How can we really understand this lattice of balls um, from the simple example? So here we've placed the Earth at some distance from us. And we're showing a couple of the geodesics, which are leaving your eye in the direction of the Earth. So you can see they all start out from your eye, some pointed in your peripheral vision up and down, one right down the middle, and then two kind of in between. But because of the way geodesics spiral in this space, um, it actually turns out the, the middle, like the, the purple light ray and the, the orange light rays, so the center of your vision and your far out peripheral vision, both end up hitting the Earth. That is, you see the Earth right in front of you, and you see the Earth in your peripheral vision. But in between, you don't see the Earth. Those, those gray light rays, as they spiral and wave through space, they actually skip over the Earth and miss it. So in that direction, you see black space. And so that's, this is kind of the explanation for why you see rings, why that sort of thing is happening. Outer light rays hit the Earth, inner light rays hit the Earth, in between light rays actually sneak past the Earth and skip over it. 
I guess we'll see how the how the frame rate is here. Otherwise, you can play with this one too live. Um, but this is just a recording of the same sort of thing, but letting you see the ring. I've I've made just a, a fake simulation of like the Earth and Moon orbiting the Sun, just to give you a familiar familiar picture. So when the Earth is in front of the Sun, we'll wait a second here; it'll come back. The Earth is close to us, close enough that the geometric lensing caused by these spiraling geodesics isn't affecting your view. And so the Earth-Moon system looks relatively normal. But as the Earth orbits the Sun, it gets farther away from us. And at a certain point, it gets so far away that it bursts into these rings, exactly like we saw in that last slide, because geodesics that were heading away from you end up reconverging. So this is some of the some of the stuff that I really enjoy about trying to get this inside view picture is it let me understand things that I didn't understand about these geometries before. Like I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought before trying to make an inside view, what does this central direction of nil look like? I wouldn't have, like even knowing that the geodesics are spirals, I wouldn't have thought about it this way or had this sort of intuition for it. And so that's what I think is really, really cool about this project. Not only do you get cool pictures, and a way to understand these three-dimensional spaces, but you, you get a new intuition that I didn't have from studying these spaces before. So I'll stop there. So we got a bunch of time for questions, but thanks everybody for attending. Thank you very, very much, Steve. That was fabulous. I especially loved the earth pictures because I could <laughs> relate to them. And it's been so wild. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. So Saul, Saul has a good suggestion here. Talk about caustics. So, so this is one thing you could, you can see in, in Euclidean space from focusing light. So I actually just happen to have a glass sphere sitting on my desk here. <laughs> but if you were to bring this outside or a magnifying glass, like um, that causes light to focus and causes light to get really, really bright at the focal point compared to other spots. This is actually happening in these geometries just due to geometry itself. So in nil geometry, while when we see these rings happening, if you imagined like, if you imagined here the earth being a light source, like pretend the earth was the sun in this video. Um, for a while, the sun's not very bright. And then when it makes that ring, it takes up a huge amount of your vision. That means tons of directions leaving you are as bright as the sun. That is where you're standing right there. The sun is extremely bright. And then you move a little bit, the sun's ring shrinks away and the sun goes back to being normal brightness. So depending on where you stand in nil geometry, you either are fine or you get fried by a light source. <laughs> if you look on the sides of the tiling here, you see these bright stripes that are happening like along the edges there. Those bright stripes are caused by the light sources. So these red, yellow, and blue balls are actually emitting light in space. And at certain points, that light focuses and becomes super bright. And that's actually causing the lighting on this tiling here. So all the lighting here is done for us. Um, did we use quaternions for any of our computer simulations? So in the three sphere, um, we quaternions give a really nice way to talk about things. So we, the build some simulations in there using quaternions. And I guess they're used technically inside of the code to encode orientations in space, like encode directions. But that's more just like a convenient computational choice. In the rest of these geometries, there isn't anything like naturally quaternionic going on. But in the three sphere, absolutely. Was the first Gaussian example the same as gravitational lensing? So not quite, but it's a very, it's, it's the exact same idea, but this is happening in Romanian geometry. So this is happening in a geometry of just space. Um, whereas gravitational lensing is really happening in Lorentzian geometry. So in a geometry of space time, but the same idea is happening. So curvature in space time causes the geodesics that light follow to bend. And so that's what causes the distortion around the black hole, just like around the Gaussian problem. How hard would it be to show the bridge in your simulation? Oh man, okay, so the, <laughs> so you, you can do this, but it doesn't really make too much mathematical sense, which is the reason I didn't do it. Um, and the short answer is the, what you see is extremely confusing. So in Euclidean space, the reason it makes sense to paste, 
paste the world on a big sphere out at infinity is because we can make some sense of like an ideal boundary to Euclidean space. We can talk about like the, the sphere out at infinity is the sphere of directions from your pi. Um, for nil geometry, there isn't really a good one of those. Almost all the light rays get sucked in one of those two directions. And so what you see, like in Euclidean space, if I made the sphere that I'm painting the bridge on of radius 10 or of radius 1,000 or of radius a million, it wouldn't change what I'm actually seeing. Like no matter how big I make my sphere that I'm painting this picture on, my vision's the same. But in nil geometry, if you tried to do this by pasting it something on a sphere, there's a lot of problems. But one of them is that, that it would actually depend on how big of a sphere you're pasting it on. Um, and if you try, to, you try to say, okay, let's just move really, really far along the geodesic and then sample the bridge picture, um, you end up getting just a, a whole mess of colors mostly coming from the two directions on the bridge, but everywhere in front of you. Um, I don't have a simulation like that, I think, posted anywhere right now, but I'm totally happy to make a confusing video of that. I can post a, <laughs> post a link to it on the website. <laughs> um, there's also a question in the Q&A from Paul Rusin. I'll read it. You said an arbitrary three manifold can be decomposed into these canonical forms. Does that mean that several of these geometries are affecting the geodesics at the same time in an arbitrary manifold? Great question. Yeah. So if, if we are lucky and there's a future like part two to this research project, what we'd <laughs> like to do is put these geometries together, like build these three manifolds out of these Lego pieces. So um, yeah, in a general space, like you can kind of imagine, I guess there's, there's different types of decomp, there's different ways that Lego pieces fit together, but the simplest way is by connect sum which means you kind of delete a sphere from the inside of two of them and you glue those together. Uh, topologically, that's like making a wormhole between two worlds. Um, you're like kind of, you're making a magical sphere that if you enter one, you can teleport over to this other part. And so there's not actually a single nice geometry on the whole space, but there's the geometry of each of these pieces connected by a tube. And so geodesics are affected by that tube. Um, I'm actually working right now on a, a simple version of this simulation for connecting Euclidean manifolds together. I don't have one running that you can play with yet, but the uh, tube connection actually causes, uh, yeah, the, the geometry of the interpolating region looks a lot like the geometry of S2 cross E, um, because that's actually the natural geometry of the tubes. So just like in this picture, you can see that there's just a single earth going on in this video but we're seeing the earth in a bunch of ring-like mirages because of the way light is spiraling around and around and around in the tube direction. When you look at these, the connect some tubes in a three manifold, on any side, it looks like one of these eight geometries we've looked at. And if you look in the tube direction, there's going to be this sort of ring type mirage of what's happening on the other side. So I'm really excited to try and get something like that working. Thanks, Steve, again. Thank you, Stu, that was great. And I also want to remind you all that there's a G4G calendar, which is really, really cool. Pictures, bios, puzzles, everything about G4G. And um, the link was recently put in the chat, and I'm sure Colm will put it in again. Okay, Saul, you can talk now. And Thank you very much. I guess I was going to ask, so what's the solution to the homework problem? Oh, you know, yeah. person's problem. Yeah. Good. <laughs> The problem is, what does it feel like to live in the three-dimensional sphere while the three-dimensional sphere is rotating, like rotating by rigid motions of our foot? Is, so is it the sphere's rotating or you're rotating? Um, you're, you're like moving along the surface of the sphere by one of those rotations. Very good. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. Or you're pasted to the sphere and you're rolling. The ball. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in... Maybe the, the first example to think about is rotations in four-dimensional space are determined by a pair of orthogonal planes. So let's fix one of those planes and not rotate it and just rotate the other plane. Um, so I'm just like, basically, if, if I were in the space, this would correspond to me moving maybe along a geodesic through my chest, just translating forwards without me rotating at all mm -hmm. along that line. So I'm just kind of like, I'm sliding forwards like, a, like an astronaut with a jet pack or something. Um, now, my head and my feet want to stay the same distance from my chest <laughs> because, I mean, my, my spine. 
but <laughs> spherical geometry doesn't like that. Like my head wants to follow a geodesic, my feet want to follow a geodesic, and my chest wants to follow a geodesic. If there's no forces acting on us, we're just freely rotating. Are they all lying along that geodesic? That seems safest. If yeah, they lie along the GSF translation, that might oh, be. Oh, if they lie, yeah. So if I were to put my head, like if I were to, if I were to like Superman, or like Superman, yeah, there you like go. yeah, that would definitely be safest. But right now, let's let's say that's not happening. I'm standing up and I'm like I'm like walking towards or something. I, I have a bad feeling. Yeah. So uh, in the three sphere, GSFs want to focus. They want to bend in, and so I'm actually going to feel pressure on my head pushing down, and I'm going to feel my feet pushing up. Like I'm going to feel like space is crunching, trying to squish me. And if you go fast enough, it will just squish you. <laughs> Hyperbolic space has, has the opposite problem since geodesic spread out. If you try and walk forwards too quickly in hyperbolic space, you just get ripped apart. Like your head wants to follow the top geodesic and you want to follow the bottom geodesic and those spread upward exponentially. But Thurston's question actually has a really interesting solution. Um, so that's only what happens if you move without rotating. The other thing I could do is I could rotate without moving. I could fix that plane and I could spin myself, like kind of like around a pinwheel around my chest. Um, and then it kind of works like it works in Euclidean space. When you spin, your head and feet are moving along a circle. And since a circle, like uh, they're moving along a small circle, not a GNS thing, um, you feel centripetal force. And so we know that kind of like if you lay down a merry ground, you feel your head being pulled up, you feel your legs being pulled up. Oh, nice. And in the three sphere, um, actually, the the quaternions acting by the quaternions rotate in both planes simultaneously at the same time, right. so they um, cancel. And so they cancel exactly. Yeah. So actually, yeah. The answer to Thurston's question is that it doesn't feel like anything if you move. No, no, if you use the correct subgroup of S, you use the correct sub. Yeah. He actually he kind of leads you to it. He has two parts to the question. He asks like, what does it feel like for a general subgroup and then for quaternions? Got it. Um, okay. Yeah. Have you thought about the title? I think these are called tidal forces, right? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about the tidal forces in, in the non-isotropic <laughs> geometries? Well, haven't, haven't computed anything there yet. Um, <laughs> I tried thinking about what I would need to compute in nil. And then, mm -hmm. I would like to ask, how is this related to multiple images of star due to gravitational lensing due to uh, black holes? Oh. Great question. So again, that, that's a that's a Lorentzian geometry situation, but it's very yeah. analogous to what's going on here. So when you see a star in two different directions or a galaxy in two different directions due to gravitational lensing, it's because the curvature of space time has caused two geodesics that are originally diverging from your eyes to get refocused and hit that point far out. So one of the geodesics was leaving your eye to the left, one was leaving your eye to the right, but space-time curvature caused them to reconverge, means you see that same object, both of the left of your eye and of the right of your eye. So you see two images of it. And so that's what's going on kind of in this video here with S2 cross E geometry. There's only a single sphere, but the curvature of space is causing us to see all of these multiple images um, exactly the same way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Saul, so hyperbolic geometry literally makes your head explode. Yep. <laughs> well, if there are no more questions, I guess we should uh, probably wrap up. Thanks, Steve. This was an awesome talk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, everyone who's still here for coming by. Have a good Sunday, everyone.